as the visiting professor uh, for this month. John practices in Sioux Falls, South Dakota with Vance Thompson Vision and is an associated professor at the Sanford School of Medicine, the University of South Dakota. He received his MD from Mayo in 2004 and did his ophthalmology residency at Duke, finishing in 2008. He performed a fellowship in cornea, external disease, glaucoma, and refractive surgery, finishing in 2009 at Minnesota Eye Consultants uh, with Drs. Lindstrom, Harton, Samuelson, and Davis. And he, he's received numerous awards, too many to count, but some including the top 100 most influential people in ophthalmology worldwide. He's the common teacher of the year at the Medical School for Ophthalmology and he's one of the top three ophthalmologists under 50 worldwide. He has more than 40 peer-reviewed publications and more than 30 book chapters and podcasts. He's widely regarded as one of the leading international cataract surgeons and has already performed more than 35,000 eye surgeries around the globe, but it looks like he's about to perform some more down in El Salvador. He published work um, primarily focused on the fundamental causes of glaucoma, minimally, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, and astigmatism management during and after cataract surgery. He's been involved in numerous FDA monitor clinical trials on some of the most exciting technologies in ophthalmology. He founded Equinox, which is developing the first non-surgical, non-pharmacologic way to lower eye pressure for glaucoma treatment. He co-invented the MKO melt, which provides sedation during cataract surgery without the use of an IV. Additionally, he created astigmatismfix.com, which helps thousands of surgeons per month fix residual astigmatism after cataract surgery. Finally, in an effort to improve access to care, he co-founded expertopinion.md, which provides online opinions to patients from top doctors around the world. His commitment to the underserved is demonstrated by leadership in Eye Care America, as well as in the Mission Vision Program at Vance Thompson Vision, where he performs numerous free surgeries every year. Dr. Berdahl also continues to serve the impoverished on mission trips worldwide. He's truly a gift to our field of ophthalmology, and we are excited that he's joined us today for Grand Rounds. The title of his lecture today will be A Tale of Two Pressures, CSF Pressure in Glaucoma, John, thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule and welcome. David and Stephen, thank you guys so much for the invitation. I'll pull up my slides and see if we can rock and roll here. And while I'm doing that, you know, I, I am a consultant for a lot of glaucoma companies, including the one I founded called Equinox, which is part of what we'll be talking about. <clears throat> Let's take a second and look at these words by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. And in this talk entitled The Tale of Two Pressures, you know, that's the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities. And I don't know that there's words that capture the state of our world right now better than these words by Charles Dickens, right? We're all trying to figure out what we should believe and where the foolishness is and, and are we in the winter of despair and is the spring of hope coming? But it also applies to glaucoma. And, um, you know, it's the best of times. We've got more treatments than we ever have, but we still have patients like those first three that were presented that we don't really know what to do with. It's the season of light, but it can be the season of darkness. And um, have we been in the age of foolishness for a long time? And is there a reason to believe that something better is coming? And so I really like this image because I think that sometimes we get the facts confused with the truth. And if you look at that image over on the right, you would say for sure that was created by a sphere or a circle. And the one over on the left would have been created by a square. But you have to zoom out to see the more complete truth and ask those questions, why? Um, what is really going on in these conditions? So we're going to talk about some problems, and we touched on this a little bit, so forgive me if there's any redundancy, but problem number one, 
What is glaucoma? The answer is we don't know. We do know it's an optic neuropathy with characteristic visual field cupping or visual field loss and characteristic cupping, but we don't know what the disease is. Well, what causes the cupping and the visual field loss? We don't know. But we do know that IOP matters. Why does IOP oh. matter? Real quick, I don't think we your slides are showing. Oh, the slides aren't going. It looks like. No, they're they're showing. Oh no! Oh no! They're, no, no, they are oh, they're the, not advancing. The, they're not advancing. Yeah. So you showing don't your see summary. Problem screen. number three. We see your summary screen that shows the, the the slides on the left and the first slide, but we don't see it advancing. Mm -hmm. Jan, put it in the presenter mm -hmm. mode. Okay. Let's try. And then share time, your guys. screen first. First. Put it in the presenter mode and then go and share your screen. That may help. Okay, let's try that. Well, I've done this a zillion times, so I should be pretty good at it by now. Uh, let's see. Presentation here. Okay. And then. Do you guys have problem number three? Okay. Yep. And yep. now do you have Yes. Do you yep. have problem number 1? Yes. Okay, great. Great, thank you. So we don't know what glaucoma is. What causes the cupping and visual field loss? We don't know that either. We know IOP matters. Why does IOP matter? We don't know why IOP actually matters in glaucoma but at least we know that IOP is the pressure inside the eye. But we're wrong about that. I like this quote by Herbert Spencer who says, how often misused words generate misleading thoughts. Intraocular pressure should mean the pressure within the eyeball. Inter means between, like an inter-state highway. Trans means across like the transatlantic cable. What we really measure when we measure IOP is the pressure differential across the cornea. We're applinating or flattening the cornea. So the pressure on the outside is equal to the pressure on the inside. And we call that intraocular pressure, but we haven't been thinking about it the right way. And so I have this idea um, when I was scuba diving as a first year resident and to the residents out there, your naivety is an asset. Ask questions. You're not in the box yet. You've not been contained by dogma. And I, I read a study once that meaningful contributions only usually happen within like cataclysmic things only happen within the first five years of completing your training. Now that's not for sure. And if you get good at challenging dogma early on, but take advantage of that and ask questions when you're allowed to be stupid. So the weight of the atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. And I'm not sure if that, if you can faintly see those numbers on my screen, but 760 millimeters of mercury is pushing down us on us when we're at sea level. The pressure inside our eye, the transcorneal pressure difference is 15 millimeters of mercury. So the pressure inside our eyeball is 15 millimeters of mercury higher than that, 775 millimeters of mercury at sea level. Now, if you go up to Denver, there's about 150, 140 less millimeters. Unmute, unmute. Sorry about that. Okay, John. you got me back? Yeah. No, no problem. Okay, so when you go up into the mountains in Denver, <sighs> Mile High City, you've got only 620 millimeters of mercury of pressure pushing down on your eye and your whole body. So the pressure inside your eye in Denver is actually 635 millimeters of mercury. Now, despite the uh, prevalent use of recreational drugs in Colorado, many people in Denver still, people in Denver get glaucoma at the same rates that everybody else does even though the pressure inside their eyeball is about 150 millimeters of mercury less. 
Why is that? And then where I had this idea is when I went scuba diving. If you go to scuba diving and you're down just 30 feet below the surface, you add a whole atmosphere of pressure that increases the pressure inside your eye to 1,535 millimeters of mercury. How is that possible? So I'm on the one vacation I get as a first year resident. We're in the Caribbean. I'm scuba diving with my wife. And I get this idea that how is it possible I could have this much pressure inside my eye and not be going blind. And so instead of enjoying a Corona on the beach with my wife, I'm like a dog with a bone with this idea. So the pressure inside the eye doesn't matter because in Denver, people still get glaucoma. The pressure difference across the cornea does matter, but glaucoma doesn't occur there. It occurs at the optic nerve head. Why? Because the pressure difference across the cornea is probably a surrogate for the pressure difference across the optic nerve head where glaucoma, glaucoma occurs. So the common belief has always been that glaucoma is a one pressure disease, intraocular pressure. But the more likely truth is that glaucoma is a two pressure disease, a balance between intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure. And this imbalance is critical. And we call that the translaminar pressure difference or the translaminar pressure gradient. The gradient will be if there's a thin lamina cribrosa that stretches out with time. And I love this image, that this histology image by Yost Jonas. Okay, so that's what's going on at the back of the optic nerve. There's your intraocular space. CSF bathes the optic nerve right to the back of the eye. In fact, it bathes more of the optic nerve and it's exposed to that pressurized fluid more than it's exposed to the intraocular pressure. And it's only about 500 to 700 microns away from the all important intraocular pressure. How would it be possible that that CSF pressure, intracranial pressure doesn't matter? And so this is just basic physics, right? If you got a force on one side that's higher than the force on the other side of an equation, you're going to get a net force. But if you've got two equal forces, uh, no net force is generated, uh, equal and opposite forces cancel. But if IOP is higher than intracranial pressure, you're going to get a backwards bowing of the optic nerve and cupping occurs. The opposite thing happens in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You get an intracranial pressure that's higher than intraocular pressure and the optic nerve bows forward. And so we know that intraocular or intracranial pressure affects the optic nerve head. We see it in IIH. I actually think that that's what hypotony is. You lower the eye pressure and now intracranial pressure is higher than IOP and you get optic nerve head swelling and the uh, eye bows forward. And if you look over on that image of the right in the glaucoma and we talk about why does glaucoma accelerate? Well, look at how thin that lamina cribrosa is compared to this one. As that lamina cribrosa thin, there's less space separating the intraocular and the intracranial space. And so now instead of going up a gradient, it's like a waterfall and swimming up a waterfall. So I come back from my scuba diving trip. I'm feeling great. I figured out what glaucoma is. I go to one of my glaucoma professors and I say, hey, I think I figured out what glaucoma is. And I explain it to him. He says, no, you didn't go back on call. So I did what any good resident does. I find a different, better, more likable professor. And I t tell them about my idea. And I say, hey, I think I figured out what glaucoma is. And he said, I don't think that you're right, but go study it. And so I went to the Mayo Clinic and looked at, and, and uh, Randy cited that paper that we did. And there's not a lot of patients that had uh, proven glaucoma in there, but we had to sift through 55,000 lumbar punctures to find those patients that have the eye exams to say, yes, we're good. we know they have ocular hypertension, glaucoma, et cetera. So we looked through 55,000 um, different patients, and here's what we found. We found that patients with ocular hypertension had a high intracranial pressure. It's probably protective from going on to developing glaucoma. Control, the CSF pressure was about 11.8 millimeters of mercury. Now, what do we usually measure intracranial pressure in? What units? Centimeters of water or millimeters of water? 
I think that that's one of the reasons people haven't made this correlation previously, because it's not that, you know, deep science. It's just that we were measuring different units. So the average intracranial pressure is about 12 millimeters of mercury. Glaucoma patients had an intracranial pressure of 9.1 on average and uh, normal tension glaucoma 8.7 on average. And keep in mind, this was a retrospective study. So then Rujan Ren and Mingli Wang did a prospective study on this where they did lumbar punctures on glaucoma patients. And they published that, I think, in the Chinese Journal of Forced Experimentation. And what they found... The, Okay, good. I was hoping somebody would ask. Um, what they found was indeed intracranial pressure stepped out in a similar way to what we saw. Since that time, these papers have been cited over 400 times. They've taken um, monkeys and lowered their intracranial pressure while their intraocular pressure was normal, and indeed they just cut out and got glaucoma. Now, this is another paper that we published. This was published in IOVS. And this is what happens to intracranial pressure with age. So I, um, I'm going to ask the residents a question. What happens with intraocular pressure with age? Somebody? Go for it. I'll give you three options. Goes up, goes down, doesn't change. It increases. In increases? Yeah, I believe. Okay, we got one for increase. Anybody joining him? I'll say increase too. Okay, we got one for increase. How many people say it stays the same? We got one for stays the same. How many people say that it goes up? Most of you are wimps and didn't vote. Oh, yeah, you said it goes up. How many people say it goes down? Anybody? It stays the same or goes down. What happens with the prevalence of glaucoma with age? Goes up. Right? Doesn't quite add up, right? Well, we did this. We, this is 14,000 lumbar punctures make up this curve. And look at what happens at age 65 intracranial pressure starts to really go down. If this graph was flipped upside down and we said it was intraocular pressure going up, we would say that's definitely the cause of glaucoma. But indeed, intracranial pressure it starts to fall off the table at age 65. Interestingly, intracranial pressure also increases with BMI. Lou Pasquale published a paper that showed that um, after controlling for IOP, even though people that have a higher BMI usually have a little higher IOP, it was protective from glaucoma. So it's one of the few conditions where cheeseburgers might help you. you know, and we talked about salt tablets and trying to raise blood pressure at night. As we talked about that with a bunch of investigators, V8, soy sauce, potato chips, salt tablets. We're trying to do all of these things that are safe for our vulnerable patients to try and support whatever it is that's causing that optic nerve to get worse, um, you know, and potentially at nighttime, which is a vulnerable period. So BMI, elevated BMI is protective of glaucoma. Does that make sense with other things that we know? Kind of. Who gets intra, uh, intracranial, idiopathic intracranial hypertension? People that have higher BMIs typically, right? So it's not a surprise that BMI would be correlated with intracranial pressure. So here's what I really fundamentally think is going on. The optic nerve is made up of retinal ganglion cells. They've got their cell body in your retina, and they're long. They go from your eye back to your lateral geniculus, and, and they're metabolically active. And then they've got axonal transport going back and forth in both directions. And it has been definitively shown, Harry Quigley showed this in a classic 1976 paper, that if you raise intraocular pressure, axonal transport stops or slows at the level of the lamina fibrosa. This has also been shown by lowering intracranial pressure, that if you lower intracranial pressure and leave intraocular pressure normal, axonal transport stops or slows at the level of the lamina fibrosa. And I think about it as like a salmon swimming up river. OK, 
okay? If it's, there's just a river, it can swim up. But all of a sudden, if you change that pressure differential, it's harder. That salmon might have to jump up and avoid the grizzly bear. But if you make it a waterfall, you can't get up that pressure differential and axonal transport builds up, the toxic metabolites build up, and eventually the apoptotic signal is sent and the gangrene cell dies. And that's what this graphic is intended to uh, show. You have axonal transport accumulants that if the pressures are normal, no problem. But if the pressure starts to get high, it slows down. If it's really high, those uh, cargoes from axonal transport stop. And it doesn't matter which direction the axonal transport is or which direction um, the pressure gradient is. If it's IIH, it stops anterior to the level of the lamina cribrosa. If it's glaucoma, it stops posterior to the lamina cribrosa. Now, this has some implications with space. And I got um, invited to be on the Vision for Mars team, and I get to meet, got to meet a bunch of astronauts because on long-term space flight, astronauts are losing their vision. The condition is called SAN, Space Associated Neuro-Optic Syndrome. And what I believe, not everybody, but what I believe is happening there is in space, there's no gravity. So what happens to your cerebral spinal fluid at your eye level? It goes up. Because if you look at astronauts before they get on, on flight, you know, they're chiseled and ripped and got all the right stuff. And then they're up in space for two days and they look chubby. And it's because their fluids have shifted towards their head and their faces puff out. Well, that's what's happening with CSF too. So if normal is like this, where you've got intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure a little bit lower than that, in space now, intracranial pressure is elevated at eye level. So what would you expect to see if that were the case in this disease? You'd expect to see optic nerve head edema. Check. You actually see corrodal folds. You see a hyperopic shift. And you see... Um, uh, and you actually see enlargement of the subarachnoid sheath around the optic nerve head. And what does that look like? That looks a lot like hypotony, doesn't it? Choroidal folds, optic nerve head swelling, hyperopic shift, decreased axial length. So what they do to simulate long-term space flight is fascinating. They put volunteers in seven degree head down tilt for one month, two months, or three months. And they have to stay there the whole time to simulate what it's like to be in gravity. Now they would do this and they could never reproduce sand. They could never reproduce the papilledema because they gave them three 30 minute breaks per day. They'd allow them to prop themselves up on their shoulder, have something to eat or drink, and then they'd go and lay back down and head down tilt for months. They said, we're being too nice. We're going to take that away. You now have to eat and drink in head down tilt too because there's no break in space. And what did they see? They saw papilledema occur. That implies that perhaps if you just give the optic nerve a break three times a day for 30 minutes, maybe you allow that axonal transport to resume, deliver the metabolic needs, remove the metabolic waste, and prevent the disease from happening in the first place. This is a study that I was <clears throat> talking about, again, by Ning Li Wang. Bob Weinreb was on this, too, looking at um, experimentally induced uh, glaucoma by reducing CSF pressure in monkeys. And what they found is if you decrease CSF pressure, you get neuroretinal rim thinning in these monkeys. So let's go back to these questions that we asked at first. Why does IOP matter? Well, IOP, which probably should be called the transcorneal pressure difference, is actually a surrogate for the translaminar pressure difference. It's not absolute pressures that matter. It's pressure differentials that matter. And it's pressure differentials that occur where the disease occurs that matter. And so the translaminar pressure across the optic nerve head, I think, is the fundamental Challenge. So what causes the cupping in the visual field loss? Well, the cupping is caused by a higher intraocular pressure than intracranial pressure. That puts a backwards force on the optic nerve head, and the optic nerve head starts to move back. What causes the visual field loss? That's ganglion cell death. Why does the ganglion cell die? The ganglion cell dies because the, its metabolic needs aren't met. 
And so as that axonal transport stops at the level of lamina cribrosa, either the lack of nutrients or the buildup of toxins leads to the apoptotic signal and the ganglion cell ultimately dies. So what is glaucoma? Well, I'm a former math teacher, so we'll put it in an equation. It's the intraocular pressure minus the intracranial pressure. That's the translaminar pressure difference. You divide that by the thickness of the lamina cribrosa, probably more likely the biomechanics of the lamina cribrosa, and maybe corneal hysteresis can help us there. And you get the translaminar pressure difference, and then you multiply that by time. Ganglion cells die, and we get glaucoma. And maybe there are some other things that are involved, like uh, you know, retinal blood flow or optic nerve sheet, optic nerve perfusion. But not everybody believes, right? And and that's what's so great about this. This is our world, guys, and especially to these residents, we're responsible um, for this beloved profession we have, and we need to be responsible to truth and doing science. And so I published it. We published this paper now, Cal, 12 years ago in ophthalmology, and. Um, Dr. Hay Ray, who's one of the real optic nerve head experts in the world at the University of Iowa, he disagreed with what we said. And he submitted a, a editorial to ophthalmology. They didn't publish it, so he published it in Gracie's, which he was the chief medical editor of. So I just happened to come across it. And um, he said this, a recent study claimed that CSF pressure may play an important contributory role but in this study, it was 3.8 millimeters of mercury. The concept that a translaminar pressure difference of only 3.8 millimeters of mercury produced by low CSF is enough to cause backwards bowing of the dense, compact, connective tissue of the lamina cabrosa has little scientific credibility. Okay? So he threw a punch, and, and I think he believed what he said. So, you know, we said, hey, let's get into the game a little bit. And so we started with, we appreciate and recommend the tremendous contributions Dr. Henry has made to ophthalmology, and in particular, our understanding of the optic nerve head. Thus, it's with humble respect we disagree with his conclusions. Scientific validity is assessed by well-controlled study design to address a hypothesis, not expert opinion. That was maybe a shot. He replies with, this is speculation and simple armchair philosophy on what we're saying, and goes on to say that we cite Yablonsky in support of their hypothesis. He says he talked to Yablonsky. However, Yablonsky wasn't prepared to accept any scientific evidence contradicting his belief, and it was never published. Birdall and colleagues say none of the studies Dr. Hayre cites are designed to address whether a chronic pressure difference across the lamina cribrosa would lead to glaucomatous cupping and said, I do not waste my precious time reaching, researching topics which have no scientific logic in merit. In conclusion, therefore, it's evident that contrary to the hypothesis by Birdall and colleagues, there is no scientifically valid evidence that low CSF or CSF pressure plays any role in optic disc cupping. This is what Thomas Henry Huxley called the great tragedy of science the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. But it's the facts that we need, even if they are ugly and one unwelcome, I tried above in the editorial to present facts. How great is this, right? That we can get into this scientific arena and make it fun and explore truth and try and see what ultimately we can do to protect the most precious of senses that we have alone. Now he's not alone. Um, I submitted a grant to um, try and see if we can change the pressure in front of the eyes with a pair of goggles to the AGS for a young science, uh, young scientist grant supposed to be given to a young ophthalmologist in the first five years of life that has a crazy idea. Well, that's me then. Um, ideas may be still crazy, but not so much young anymore. And the feedback I got was it would be unethical to proceed given the complete lack of scientific evidence. It'd be great if it wasn't based entirely on flawed judgment. And my personal favorite, rabbits wouldn't wear goggles. Says who? How do you know rabbits won't wear goggles? And so if, if you don't think I'm crazy yet, I'm going to kind of remove all doubt now, and we're going to talk a little bit about this VIIP just for a second. So this is what the optic nerve head looks like 
um, when astronauts come back from space in VIIP or what's now called sand. So you get this globe flattening in the back. So you see how that globe isn't round. That leads to a hyperopic shift. Because you've kind of made the room smaller, you get choroidal folds and you get optic disc edema. And I'll point out how thick that um, optic nerve sheath is, that distension in the CSF that's right there. So, so I come out of Duke and I'm going to do my fellowship with Dick Lindstrom, who's just one of the most incredible humans I've ever met. And I share this story with him and he says, yeah, I think you're right. What are you going to do about it? I said, what do you mean? What am I going to do about it? People are going to think I'm smart and I'm going to be famous. And he says, well, I actually like scientific discoveries to help patients and maybe even turn it into a company that can help everybody involved. And I said, well, I don't have any good ideas. He said, that's okay. Opportunity favors the prepared mind. And so just to close out in the last five or 10 minutes here, we'll talk about kind of taking a concept and turning it into actually a product that might help people. This is my patient. This is my normal tension glaucoma patient, Jerry. He has no light perception in his left eye after a complication of glaucoma surgery that I did. His right eye is 2400. His IOP is 11. He's had nine eye surgeries that I've done, including two cornea transplants, and he's still going blind. What do we do for somebody like this? It's really hard. I mean, we can sit there and watch him go blind and not put them at risk from iatrogenic risk, but we got to find better answers. So what's bothering you today? Here's what bothers me. We need a safer treatment for the toughest glaucoma. Over 30% of patients in the United States that have open angle glaucoma, have normal tension glaucoma, and don't have a high pressure. That's way over 70% in East Asia. And treating normal tension glaucoma and severe glaucoma as in those first three cases is really tough. So this is what we developed. It's called a multi-pressure dial, and it's basically a pair of goggles that is attached to a negative pressure vacuum so that when you lower that pressure, you remove some of the atmospheric weight over the eye. So imagine ourselves as pressurized human beings. All 760 millimeters of mercury of weight of the atmosphere is pushing down on our entire body our eye, our CSF, our blood. All we simply do is say, we're going to take some of that pressure out of the goggles, release some of that weight over the eye. Now the pressure in the eye goes down relative to all the other pressures in the body, relative to the intracranial pressure and relative to blood pressure. We touched on this before. Intraocular pressure goes up at night. Drugs don't work that well to lower it at night. There's a fascinating study in over 6,000 people out of Wilmer Eye Institute, and that showed that the longer you sleep, the higher your risk of glaucomatous progression, to the point that if you sleep over 10 hours per night, you've got a threefold risk in the progression of glaucoma. So what does the science say? We've studied this now in over 500 eyes. The study up here um, was done with our first in man study in three patients. We went over to Germany. These patients had a wireless eye pressure sensor. The, the device was the implant data device. They had a wireless eye pressure sensor implanted into their eyes. We put the goggles on. We draw down the pressure. We draw it down by two millimeters of mercury. It goes down by about a millimeter and a half. We draw it down, down, down. Each one of those points is drawing down a little bit more vacuum so that we can titratively lower IOP. We hold it there for an hour and we dial it back up. One of the things that was really interesting is we had a pre-treatment pressure of 25, 15, and about 10. And we took the 25 to 18, the 15 down to nine, and the nine down to four and held it there and dialed it back up. Then we came into the study in our office with the goggles on, and we measured it um, across. So what we did is we put a hole in the goggles. We put a tonal pen cover over the top of that. We used a Model 30 pneumotonometer to check the pressure as we were uh, lowering as we were lowering it. We took people from 16 down to 13, down to 11, down to 10. We've completed our FDA study. We're at the FDA right now. 
and we're hoping uh, that we'll have a product to titratively and non-invasively lower eye pressure in the middle of 2021. And so that this is the data that I just shared with you, dialing it down from 16 to 13 to 11 to under 10 millimeters of mercury. And so there's real unmet needs in glaucoma. We've got a bajillion things that we can do for mild to moderate glaucoma. We've got a ton of different drops. We've got SLT. The angle has become one of the most crowded anatomical spaces that we have. And although we've made some progress in severe glaucoma with things like Zen and the uh, the pressure flow shunt that's coming, we really haven't focused on the toughest to treat of our patients. And those are the ones that really need it, the ones that are at risk of the lights going out. And so we're trying to make something that's non-surgical, non-pharmacologic, be able to dial it in, study it well, but mostly we're trying to give hope to people that didn't have hope anymore because they we ran out of options and we just didn't know what to do. And so with that, I'll end with the exact same place we started. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. And it was the spring of hope. And if we can take out those middle ones, it becomes, it was the best of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the epoch of belief, it was the season of light, and it, and hopefully in glaucoma and in our world, we are entering the spring of hope. Thank you guys for listening and happy to take any questions. Wonderful, John. Thank you so much. That was really enjoyable right. and very insightful and a great story for the residents about thinking and pursuing their uh, their beliefs. Uh, when I open up to the floor, I'm sure Bill has a question. I have a question right <laughs> off. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> is, is it primarily nighttime that you want to do this? You have the people wearing the goggles because that's probably when this mismatch is most pronounced, right? Yeah, it probably is. And that's what we think is that you know nighttime is a vulnerable period blood pressure goes down eye pressure goes up CSF pressure we're not quite sure what happens to at night so that's where we think um it makes the most sense to start it's not to say that it couldn't be worn around the clock and uh, the lenses are standard a frame so you can put uh refractive errors into them or bifocals into them if people need to see through while they're wearing them so I'll, I'll say one tiny thing and then shut up it also is is mechanical pressure on the eye also a big factor in raising intraocular pressure, sleeping on your arm or something like that? Because the, the goggles also help that problem. That, yeah, that's right. And, you know, I want, in, you know, and you see the same thing in keratoconus too, right? Sometimes you've got pillow divers that are really putting a bunch of pressure on their eyes. And I wonder that same thing. And every time when I put my head down at night, I mean, I'd say four out of seven nights, I think about two things. One, I have this image of little axonal transport stopping at the level of the lambda cribrosin building up and ganglion cells dying. And number two, I think about where are my hands in relationship to my eye and how am I, how is my eye pushing down into my pillow? So I, I totally agree with you. Really good insight. Okay. There's a question in the chat. Your CSF IOP gradient hypothesis as a histiopathologic ideology of glaucoma seems to discount peel plexus vascular pressure. So it's the age old question of a mechanical versus a vascular cause. Yeah, really good question. You know, and I don't think that anybody knows for sure. I have a bias against a vascular condition. You know, with NAION, you wake up and boom, half of your visual field is totally gone overnight. And so I have a tendency to think that diseases that happen over years to decades are more metabolic and axonal transport in nature and less vascular in nature. Although I do bet that the vascular piece of it um, contributes to repair mechanism, et cetera. But, but let's talk about it because, you know, none of us really know for sure. One thing that we do know when we put on the negative pressure goggles is that we see improved blood flow. 
So regardless of if it's uh, vascular or axonal transport, lowering eye pressure matters and you because you change the pressure head, you see improved uh, blood flow. Have you tried sleeping in those goggles? I have, and more importantly, I had my wife sleep in those goggles <laughs> and she was able to do it. It's not, it's not, I mean, you'd rather take an eye drop than wear the goggles. They're, there's not a discomfort that comes from the negative pressure until you get to about minus 20 millimeters of mercury. But because facial anatomy is so varied, there are pressure points where yeah. that can be uncomfortable for some patients, depending on their kind of facial anatomy. You should be able to 3D print a mask to fit everybody's face. That's that's what we think. And if these, you know, and and these may, I mean, there's an outside shot that these end up on the International Space Station to help preserve vision for long-term space flight, and that'd be, you know, especially helpful for yeah. them because sleeping in space is a really difficult thing to do. And and what we would do for them is not negative pressure, but positive pressure. We'd be trying to add pressure to balance out the intracranial pressure. Fascinating. Anybody else? It's a quiet group today. Question if there's nobody else going to ask. No, please. So evaluating the efficacy of the goggles is really hard because glaucoma is a really slow disease. And so what kinds of things can you look for to look for short-term changes? I mean, you just mentioned that blood flow in the optic disc improves enormously. So that's already... Uh, something quite important? Really good question. So first of all, no um, drug or device for glaucoma has been approved based on slowing the progression of the disease, all on slowing uh, or lowering intraocular pressure. Also, right. you know, when you're thinking about innovation, the FDA is one bar and insurers sometimes are a higher bar. Often they're a higher bar, right? You can get an FDA approval, but not get your drug or device or whatever it is covered. And so we're, we only really lower eye pressure while the goggles are on. So the question is if we're decreasing the area under the curve or lowering it to the point where we allow kind of a dialysis of the optic nerve by allowing axonal transport to resume, does that actually affect the disease? Um, we don't know that. But what in our device, we've got a 5G LTE antenna built in so that we can monitor, monitor usage. And it would be prescribed through a durable medical equipment pathway, much like um, CPAP and uh, diabetes pumps are. And so that'll allow us to have the progression data so that in a big data way over time, we can show what kind of wear patterns actually slow the progression. But that's three years from now or five years from approval, depending on how much data we have. What could we show now that's compelling? I wish we could image axonal transport. You can kind of image some mitochondria with adaptive optics, but it's, it's not good enough you know, to hang your hat on it now. There's the dark technology which is an antibody that binds to phospholipids in the retina and in the optic nerve when a ganglion cell is on the brink before it apoptosis. So we could show that perhaps we lower eye pressure, that ganglion cell and that uh, those antibodies are no longer present. Present. Another thing that I think that you could show is a decrease in the, the stress and strength in the optic nerve head because we can do OCT imaging while the goggles are on. We can look and see if we're loosening up the optic nerve head and decreasing the stress and strain. John, just along this uh, um, blood flow and OCT images, do you ever use OCTA to look at the uh, blood supply around the optic nerve? Is it, is it any value in it at all? I think we're trying to figure that out, and it's a little bit chicken in the egg. Is it decreased blood flow that leads to glaucoma, or is it that the ganglion cells aren't there, and so you know the parapapillary uh, nexus of blood vessels isn't there anymore. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that um, veins and arteries have a smaller caliber in glaucoma patients. And I think that that was used a little bit as some evidence that perhaps it is a ischemic disease or a vascular disease, but it could be the other way too, because if the eye pressure is higher than the intracranial pressure, then the vessels would collapse and force blood back the other direction. 
just like we see in IIH, we see big, fat, ropey veins because the fluid is getting squeegeed into the lower pressure environment in the eye. John, uh, have you used? Oh, uh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, great, great talk, John. <laughs> I, I love the uh, the way you encourage uh, people to think outside the box. Uh, that's what makes it really fun. Um, what about auto regulation? I mean, why is this happening? Why is the why is there a disconnect between the two systems? Yeah, really, really good question, and we are doing some initial work on that that seems to show that in normal patients when we lower the eye pressure the blood flow increases temporarily and then it auto regulates and in glaucoma patients it doesn't so the blood the increased blood flow stays so there may be an auto regulation problem in glaucoma patients is there a way to look at that yeah, there's a technology called laser speckle flow. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the universities have it. And, and I think, from my understanding, it's mostly neuro-ophthalmologists that are using it to look at different uh, optic nerve head perfusion conditions. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OCTA won't show you flow, though. It, you, you, it's, it's a great technology to see you know, where blood is at, but it doesn't show you blood flow. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, John. Thank you so much. That was great. Great discussion. Rachel, uh, Randy, Elena, Jack, and uh, especially John, thank you so much for a wonderful grand rounds. I think we learned a lot. And I think like Scott said, the, the pearl about thinking outside the box is key. And I think an example like this is a great example um, for everyone to learn by. So we appreciate you taking the time in your busy schedule. Um, you're in El Salvador right now, is that correct? Yep, that's right, down here in El Salvador. So residents, just, just listen, he, he's on a trip in El Salvador, curing blindness in El Salvador, takes time out to give a grand rounds to us. I mean, this is, this is a great example. And we, we really appreciate you being here and spending time with us, John. My pleasure. And if I could, you know, maybe my parting words would be is that, boy, this profession, I mean, we're in the best profession in all of medicine, in the best country in the world. And if you get to be a resident in ophthalmology, you're in a pretty rarefied air elite category. And I would just encourage all of us, but especially the residents, to be purposeful about giving back more than you take out of this word, world because this profession is going to give you so much that it's going to be really hard to give back more than it takes if you're not purposeful about it. That's beautiful. I think we'll end with that. Thanks so much, John. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe, everybody. Um, yeah.